those of you who may have attended last Wednesday know that we're exploring various aspects of quarry farm for the first two lectures of this season. Tonight's the second part of that. Also, as you may have noticed in your program, Dr. Michael Pratt, our speaker tonight, has two interests that will likely combine for tonight's presentation in a very nice way. <laughs> he holds degrees in biology, environmental science, and zoology, along with a degree in computer information technology. This bodes well. <laughs> I know it means we'll have good content, and we'll probably also have some nice slides to enjoy <laughs> on the presentation. In addition to the biographical notes in the program, please know that Dr. Pratt's interest in fossils and paleontology has led to a very specific connection with the rocks here at Quarry Farm. Each spring, during his Term 3 course, Dr. Pratt brings his students to Quarry Farm with a very specific agenda to look for fossils in the vicinity of the quarry that borders the original study site. In fact, the display of fossils that you see in the case to my right, your left, is the result of those classes. And this interest in fossils has led to his wider interest in roughing it. The first major work that Samuel Clemens composed here at Quarry Farm, and which will be the subject of his talk this evening. Part. After tonight's presentation, Dr. Pratt will take questions and comments until around 5 to 9, uh, when I'll return to the front for some very brief words about next week's lecture. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Pratt. sincere appreciation and gratitude uh, to Elmira College, the Center for Mark Payne Studies, and <coughs> Dr. Uh, Barbara Snedekor for supporting my exploration of Mark Twain's interests in geology, paleontology, biology, and other natural science fields. The title of my talk tonight, Mark Twain's Nature in Roughing It, naturally, uh, like Samuel Clemens' pseudonym, has a double meaning. By the end of my talk, the dual import of the title should become evident. In his prefatory of Roughing It, Mark Twain explains to the reader that his book is merely a personal and not a pretentious history of philosophical dissertation. It is a record of several years of variegated vagabondizing, and its object is rather to help the resting reader while away an hour uh, than afflict him with metaphysics or goad him with science. Still, there is information in the volume, quite a good deal of information, which appears to stew out of me naturally, unquote. <clears throat> like Innocence Abroad, A Tramp Abroad, Life in the Mississippi, and the following equator, following the equator, and roughing it, they are ostensibly a travel, travel books. In it, Twain chronicles his six long year sojourn in the American Western frontier and a shorter side trip to the Sandwich Islands, better known today as the Hawaiian Islands. In his so-called Western book, Twain recounts typically, in vivid detail, his experiences, adventures, misadventures, and fruitless attempts to strike it rich by prospecting in the Comstock Lode. Despite his seemingly earnest claim that Roughing It is a story of his travels out west, rather than a metaphysical or scientific treatise, Roughing it is loaded with philosophical ideas and scientifically valid observations. Well over half of its 79 chapters inform the reader, however briefly, about some aspect of the natural world, ranging from plants and wild animals to vast scenic panoramas or natural phenomena. In a handful of chapters, nature in one form or another is the central protagonist. These nature passages and chapters typically convey a mix of 
objective information, subjective impressions, and meditative insights, all derived from Twain's own first-hand observations of the natural world. Consequently, Roughing It is much more than a traveler's diary of routes taken, sites visited, and people encountered. It is also a naturalist field book of facts and a nature writer's deeply personal ode about nature. American nature writing is a popular genre, encompassing diverse themes and ideas about nature. In his book, The Incomparable Land, A Guide to American <coughs> Nature Writing, Lyons proposes a system for characterizing and classifying nature writing that recognizes three basic kinds or forms of nature writing. First, empirical, objective, factual information derived from direct observation of the natural world. Two, introspective, personal, subjective prose or poetry about what one senses or feels when immersed in and interacting with nature. And three, interpretive, philosophical, spiritual insights and allegories of what one imagines or believes the essence of nature to be beneath its observable, stimulating exterior. Objective, science-oriented nature writers strive to depict some aspect of the natural world factually, accurately, and realistically, as exemplified by Peterson's Field Guide of North American Birds. Subjective, introspective writers, in contrast, may see the same facts, but express them as, a personal, as personal impressions, metaphors, and even poetry, as Aldo Leopold does in his Sand County Almanac. Philosophical nature writers strive to convey what they imagine and believe nature's underlying truths to be, including the problematic bond between humankind and the natural world. Henry Thoreau, for example, explores the deeper meaning of nature in On Walden Pond. Most authors who write about nature do so in ways that blend any two or all three forms of nature writing. As we will see later um, in my presentation, Mark Twain, ever the iconoclast, creates his own distinctive fusion of forms. During his years out west and when visiting the Sandwich Islands, Twain encountered a diverse copious supply of natural things, events, places, and oddities to write about. Despite the prominence of nature, of the natural world in Roughing It, and its other travel, his other travel books, Twain rarely appears in bibliographies of American nature writing, alongside authors such as John Muir and Rachel Carlson. Except for some excerpts from Life on the Mississippi, current anthologies of nature writing so far have not deemed Twain to be a genuine nature writer. At least three reasons might account for this apparent oversight. First, Roughing It and his other travel books have been typecast. Publishers, scholars, and the public have deemed those books primarily as comp uh, compilations of humorous stories, folksy yarns, and tall tales crafted by a masterful world-traveling storyteller. Consequently, neither the public nor the literati of his time and since then considered him to be um, a nature writer. After all, he never wrote a book just about nature. Secondly, he did, he did not promote himself as a naturalist or nature writer, even though he had an enduring, informed interest in natural history. Rather, his reputation largely flows from his humorous writings and public lectures and from two books of fiction namely The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and uh, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which, by the way, one can discern a fascinating glimpses into the natural world if one looks carefully and, and thoroughly enough. Let's examine a few excerpts from Roughing It to decide whether Mark Twain's absence from the annals of nature writers is warranted or not. It appears that the projector is kaput. Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> it's revived itself. I didn't even notice. Go ahead and just click. Touch. Okay? All right, there you go. And we've already gone through the prefatory, so touch again. And wait till the images appear. Sagebrush. Sagebrush. Take a little water break here. Uh, 
adopting the style of a field guide of Western plants, Twain in chapter 3 describes the sagebrush and its arid habitat between the Great Plains and California. He describes this ubiquitous Western shrub as follows. <coughs> If the reader can imagine a gnarled and venerable live oak tree reduced to a little shrub two feet high with its rough bark, its foliage, its twisted boughs, all complete, he can picture the sagebrush." Unquote. He then goes on to describe the sagebrush uh, in field book fashion by accurately documenting the color, aroma, and taste of its leaves, and noting how well it's adapted to its barren habitat. Quote, this, uh, the sagebrush is a singularly hardy plant that grows right in the midst of deep sand and among barren rocks where nothing else in the vegetable world would try to grow except bunch grass. Individual sagebrushes grow from three to six or seven feet apart all over the mountains and deserts of the far west, clear to the borders of California. There is not a tree of any kind in the deserts for hundreds of miles. There is no vegetation at all in a regular desert except the sagebrush." Unquote. His playful imagination then goes to work. While reclining Gulliver-like under a sagebrush, the gnats flying in and out of its sheltering foliage become teeny birds, and the ants marching back and forth uh, in shadow at the base of the at the base at its base are miniature flocks and bird miniature flocks and herds. Though not formally trained as a naturalist, Twain perceptively noted important ecological facts about the habitat, geographical range, competition, and adaptations of the sagebrush. For instance, his whimsical imagings of the gnats as birds and ants as flocks and herds reflects the common ecological phenomenon. Namely, most any habitat, for example, an expanse of desert, typically consists of a few or more distinct microhabitats. In this case, shaded underside of a sagebrush, each sustaining its own particular community of plants and animals. Also, his characterization of the sagebrush as a singularly hardy plant capable of surviving in poor soils where no other plant can is a consequence of Darwinian natural selection, leading to adaptation to local conditions. Similarly, uh, by growing a few feet apart, a population of sagebrush naturally partitions its habitat into evenly spaced plots, thereby reducing competition for scarce water and nutrients. Finally, Quain reports that the sagebrush's foul taste renders it inedible, which is a fairly common plant adaptation for discouraging plant eaters. Although it was quite unlikely that Quain actually fathomed the ecological significance of his sagebrush observations, having even made them, and then recalling them years later implies a keen awareness of the natural world in its many manifestations. Now comes to one of my favorite parts of the book. <laughs> the episode in chapter 21, pitting a tough crew of surveyors against fearsome looking tarantulas, was based on an actual event. Wayne, however, elaborates the incident and recast it into a pure slapstick. Can you picture, or will you pick, oh, as you hear this, you will be able to picture Laurel and Hardy playing the scene. The, full, the story unfolds in a rough surveyor's ranch house in Nevada. As an entertaining distraction from boredom, or simply to assert human dominion over frightful critters, the self-proclaimed Irish Brigade captured and imprisoned tarantulas under upturned heavy glass tumblers that were, quote, arranged along the shelves of the room. Some of these spiders could straddle over a common sausage with their hairy, muscular legs, and when their feelings were hurt or their dignity offended, they were the wickedest looking desperados the animal world can furnish. <laughs> if their glass prison houses were touched ever so slightly, they are up and splitting for a fight in a minute. Starchy, proud, indeed. They would take up a straw and pick their teeth like a member of Congress. Unquote. <laughs> then one dark and stormy night, yes, it was really a dark and stormy night, Mother Nature, taking care of her own, instigates a pileup of pratfalls, culminating in the great torrential escape, rescue and escape. Let's listen to Mark Twain tell a story, and only he can tell this story. Quote, there was a 
usual, there was, as usual, a furious zephyr blowing the first night of the brigade's return. And about midnight, the roof of an adjoining stable blew off, and a corner of it came crashing through the side of our ranch. There was a simultaneous awakening and a tumultuous muster of the brigade in the dark, and a general tumbling and sprawling over each other in the narrow aisle between the bedrows. In the midst of the turmoil, Bob H., by the way, Twain leaves enough space to spell out the name Hardy. <laughs> Coincidence or not? Bob H. sprung up out of sound sleep and knocked down a shelf with his head. Instantly he shouted, Turn out, boys! The tarantulas is loose! <laughs> no warning ever sounded so dreadful. Nobody tried any longer to leave the room, lest he might step on a tarantula. Every man groped for a trunk or a bed and jumped on it. Then followed the strangest silence, a silence of grisly suspense, waiting, expectancy, and fear. It was as dark as pitch, and one had to imagine the spectacle of those fourteen scant clad men roosting gingerly on trunks and beds where not a thing could be seen. The occasional voices were not given to much speaking. You simply heard a gentle, oh, followed by a solid thump. And you knew the gentleman had felt a hairy blanket or something touch his bare skin and had skipped from my bed to the floor. Another silence. Then you would hear a grasping voice say, so, so, something's crawling up the back of my neck. Every now and then you could hear a little subdued scramble and a sorrowful, oh, Lord. And then you knew that someone was getting away from something he took for a tarantula. Directly a voice in the corner rang out, Wild and clear, I've got him, I've got him. No, he's got me. <laughs> and then at that moment, Mrs. O'Flanagan enters the room with a lantern. lantern. The landscape presented when the lantern flashed into the room was picturesque and might have seemed funny to some people, but it was not to us. Although we were perched so strangely upon boxes, trunks, and beds, and so strangely attired, we were too earnestly distressed and too genuinely miserable to see any fun about it. And there was not the semblance of a smile anywhere visible. I know I am not capable of suffering more than I did during those few moments of suspense in the dark, surrounded by those creeping, bloody-minded tarantulas. I had skipped from bed to bed, from box to box, in cold agony, and every time I touched something that was furzy, I fancied I felt the fangs I had to go to war. I'd rather go to war than live that episode ever again. <laughs> Nobody was hurt. The man who thought a tarantula had got him was mistaken. <laughs> Only a crack in a box had caught his finger. But not one of those escaped tarantulas was ever seen again. We sat up the rest of the night playing cringe and keeping a sharp lookout for the enemy. Unquote. <laughs> Unquote. The Night of the Tarantulas, among several other very comical episodes in the book, illustrates how Twain extended the personal subjective form of nature writing with his unique style of humor, one that is down to earth and laugh until it hurts funny. At the risk of over-analysis, one can view the tarantula episode as an allegory in which nature's empowered minions and humans once again, once again face off in an, in, in, in an eternal struggle. On one side are the inscrutable, indifferent, primal forces of nature. On the other, human nature, intelligence, and, uh, and order. In the ensuing skirmish at the ranch that night, bump in the night darkness and imagination-fueled hysteria enabled arachnid insect instincts to triumph human intellect. Perhaps here Twain uses the comical confrontations to mock human hubris, which so confidently claims dominion over nature. The coyote monopolizes nearly one whole chapter in Roughing It. Twain initially paints a reproachful but realistic portrait of the poor creature. Quote, the coyote of the farther deserts was not a pretty creature or respectable either. It was a long, slim, sick, and sorry-looking skeleton with a gray wolf skin stretched over it, a tolerably bushy tail that forever sags down with a despairing expression of forsakenness and misery. 
a furtive and evil eye and a long, sharp face with slightly uplifted lip and exposed teeth. He has a general slinking expression all over. The coyote is a living, breathing allegory of want. He is always hungry." Unquote. Then Twain describes the coyote's untamed demeanor in, a, in his unique way, animating the portrait and revealing one of the coyote's survival strategies. Quote, he is so spiritless and cowardly that even while his exposed teeth are pretending a threat, the rest of his face is apologizing for it. <laughs> when he sees you, he lifts his lips and, let, and lets out a flash of his teeth, <clears throat> depresses his head a bit, and strikes a long, soft-footed trot, glancing over his shoulder uh, at you from time to time. And finally, the gray of his gliding coat blends with the gray of the sagebrush and he disappears. This is how he behaves when you make no demonstration against him. But if you do, he develops a livelier, a livelier interest in his journey and instantly electrifies his heels and, puts, and put, puts so much real estate between himself and your weapon that by the time you have drawn a bead on him, nothing but an unusually long-winded streak of lightning could reach him." Unquote. In an amusing scene, he tests the coyote's adaptive fleet-footedness against man's domesticated, socialized best friend. Quote, if you start a swift-footed dog after him, you will enjoy it ever so much, especially if the dog, especially if it is a dog that has a good opinion of himself and has been brought up to think he knows something about speed. The coyote will go swinging gently off on that deceitful trot of his and every little while shows a fraudful, a, fraud, a fraudful smile over his shoulder that will fill the dog entirely full of encouragement and worldly ambition and make him move his furious legs with a yet wilder frenzy and leave a denser cloud of desert sand smoking behind. But despite his efforts, the dog cannot understand why, why it is that he cannot make uh, perceptible progress, or, sorry, cannot get perceptibly closer. It makes him matter and matter to see how gently the coyote glides along and never pants or sweats or ceases to smile. And he grows still more and more incensed to see how shamefully he has been taken in. And then that town dog begins to reach for the coyote with concentrated and desperate energy. This spurt finds him six feet, just six feet behind. And then in an instant, that wild new hope is lighting up in his face. The coyote turns and smiles blandly upon him once more, as if to say, well, I should have to tear myself away from you, bub. Business is business, and it will not do for me to be fooling along this way all day. And forthwith, there is a rushing sound, and behold, that dog is solitary and alone in the midst of vast solitude." Unquote. Finally, a finishing touch of pathos and empathy completes the coyote's forlorn portrait. The coyote lives chiefly in the most desolate and forbidding desert, gets an uncertain and precarious living and earns it. He seems to subsist almost entirely on the carcasses of oxen, mules, and horses. We soon, we soon learned to recognize the sharp, vicious bark of the coyote as it came across the murky plain at night. And remembering his forlorn aspect and his hard fortune, wished him the blessed novelty of a long day's good luck and a limitless larder tomorrow." Unquote. Chapters 22 and 23 vividly illustrate Twain's personalized vision of nature's realm when he describes wilderness camping with a few prospective business partners at Lake Tahoe, deep in the Sahara Nevada mountains. The magnificence and uniqueness of the lake and the encircling range of forested mountains combined to move him emotionally and spiritually, recounting how an idyllic setting, I'm sorry, recounting how an idyllic set, sunset and forest solitude profoundly affected everyone at the Lakeshore camp. Wayne writes was essentially a poem. Quote, as the darkness closed down and the stars came out and spangled the great mirror with jewels, we smoked meditatively in the solemn hush and forgot our troubles and our pains and were lulled to sleep by the beating of the surf upon the shore." Unquote. 
In the next scene, one begins to sense the palpable euphoria that washes over Twain as he beholds the grand spectacle that is Lake Tahoe. Quote, if there is any life that is happier than the life we led at the lake, it must be a sort of life which I have not read of in books or experienced in person. We do not see a human being but ourselves during the time, or hear any sounds but those that were made by the wind and the waves, the sighing of the pines, and the far-off thunder of an avalanche. The forest about us was dense and cool. The sky above us was cloudless and brilliant with sunshine. The broad lake before us was glassy and clear, or rippled and breezy, or black and storm-tossed, according to nature's mood. And its circling border of mountain domes, clothed with forest, scarred with landslides, cloven by canyons and valleys, and helmeted with glistening snow, fitfully framed and finished the noble picture. The view was always fascinating, bewitching, entrancing. The eye was never tired of gazing, night or day, in calm or storm. It suffered but one grief, that, and that was it. It could not look always, but must close sometimes in sleep." Unquote. Twain had learned a good deal about geology prospecting the Comstock, but without success for any mineral or rock remotely valuable. In chapters 74 and 75, Hawaiian volcanoes take center stage. Blending fact with imagery, he renders an initial impression of one of nature's most awe-inspiring displays. Quote, we went to the great volcano Kilauea, picked our careful way through the billowy wastes of while the long generations ago stricken dead and cold in the climax of its tossing fury, and came upon signs of the volcano in the nature of ragged fissures that discharged jets of sulfurous vapor hot from the molten ocean down to the bowels of the mountain." Unquote. Comparisons of one natural wonder with another appear frequently in roughing it, and volcanoes are no exception. Quote, I have seen Vesuvius since, but it was a mere toy, a child's volcano, a soup kettle, compared to this. Mount Vesuvius is 3,600 feet high, its crater only 300 feet deep, and not more than 1,000 feet in diameter. Its fire is meager, modest, and docile. But here was a vast, perpendicular walled cellar, 900 feet deep in some places, 1,300 feet in others, 10 miles in circumference. Here was a yawning pit upon whose floor the armies of Russia could camp and have room to spare. He then colorizes the nighttime view of Kilauea and borrows religious cultural imagery to express what facts and measurements cannot convey about the incredible natural wonder before him. Quote, a colossal column of cloud towered, towered to a great height in the air immediately above the crater. The outer swell of every one of its vast folds was dyed a rich crimson, which was subdued to a pale rose tint in the depression below. I thought it just possible that if that its like had not been seen since the children of Israel wandered through the desert so many centuries ago over a path illuminated by a mysterious pillar of fire. And I was sure that I now had a vivid, vivid conception of what the majestic pillar of fire was light, which almost amounted to a revelation." Unquote. Almost godlike, Twain peers more deeply into the immense mesmerizing crater and finally grasps one of nature's deepest truths. Quote, for a mile and a half in front of us, and a half a mile on either side, the floor of the abyss was magnificently illuminated. Beyond these limits, the mist hung down their gauzy curtains and cast a deceptive gloom over all that made the twinkling fires in the remote corners of the crater seem countless leagues removed. Here was room for the imagination to work. You could imagine those lights the width of a continent away, and that hidden under the in intervening darkness were hills, winding rivers, and weary wastes of plain and desert. Even then, the tremendous vista stretched on and on and on. You could not compass it. It was the idea of eternity made tangible. 
and the longest end of it made visible to the naked eye." To the naked eye. Unquote. <clears throat> Chapter 55 presents the reader with one of Twain's more deeply personal and philosophical musings about nature, of which he has several in the book Roughing It. He strives to answer specifically two intrinsically unanswerable questions. First, what is the source or essence of nature's beauty, grandeur, and enchantment? And second, where and when does natural beauty reveal, reveal itself most magnificently and enchanted and uh, uh, um, most, most, uh, most magnificently? His search for answers begins in California. His view, in his view, the forests of that state suffer from a sad poverty in a variety of species. Redwood, pine, spruce, fir, fir, which belong chiefly to one monotonous family. He then tells the reader that a trek through such a forest soon becomes dull and unsatisfying, as one senses, quote, a wearisome sameness of attitude in the trees, rigid arms outstretched, stretched downward and outward in a whispering appeal to all, shh, don't say a word, you might disturb somebody. And there is a reliefless and relentless smell of pitch and turpentine, a ceaseless melancholy. And as one walks over the soundless carpet of beaten yellow bark and dead spines of the foliage, till one feels like a wandering spirit bereft of a footfall and tires of the endless tufts of needles and years for substantial shapely leaves. For moss and grass, and for moss and grass to lull upon, he finds none of that. For where there is no bark, there is no there is naked clay and dirt, enemies of pensive musing and clean apparel. Unquote. With its forests lacking a certain attractiveness, Twain finds it strange that Eastern tourists go into ecstasy over the loveliness of ever blooming California, but seem oblivious to the lavish richness the brilliant green, the infinite freshness, the spendthrift variety of form and species and foliage that made an eastern landscape a vision of paradise itself." Unquote. Thus, it is not only amusing but also pitiable that an easterner would, quote, fall into raptures over the gray and somber California, having seen New England's meadow expanses and her maples, oaks and cathedral wind windowed elms decked in summer attire, or the opaline splendors of autumn descending upon her forests. For no land with an unvarying climate can be very beautiful, and the sameness impairs its charm by and by." Unquote. To finally answer his two questions about the essence of nature's beauty and where and when that beauty is most evident, Twain confidently asserts the following. Quote, change is the handmaiden nature requires to do her miracles with. The land that has four well-defined seasons cannot lack beauty or pall with monotony. Each season brings a world of enjoyment and interest in the watching of its unfolding, its gradual harmonious development, its culminating graces. And just as one begins to tire of it, it passes away. And a radical change comes with new witcheries and new glories in its train. And I think that to one in sympathy with nature, each season, in its turn, seems the loveliest. Thus, Mark Twain's experiences traveling the world. I'm sorry. Thus, Mark Twain's experiences traveling the world. Um, nature is most beautiful and alluring whenever and wherever it puts on new faces and puts forth a richness of life. Finally, we come to um, answering the question, uh, the, dual, the dual meaning of the title of my paper tonight. Mark Twain's nature, as revealed in roughness, encompasses a rich variety of natural phenomena. Let's first turn to animals. The, animal that he, the animals that he identifies and studies, reports upon in his book, is quite diverse. Coyote, buffalo, prairie dogs, birds of several sorts, including uh, seagulls, ducks, and ravens. Insects are plentiful, including tarantulas, vermin of all sorts, such as fleas, 
um, ants, rats, centipedes, and cockroaches, of course. The plant variety is likewise diverse. In addition to the sagebrush, he talks about, discusses, observes, contemplates bunch grass, forests of several kinds, flowers, geraniums, orchids, um, fruits, vegetables, uh, grasses, ferns, and mosses come up here now and then, uh, palm tree, uh, and uh, uh, the redwoods, of course, spruce, fir, maple, hardwoods also make their appearance. There are also several kinds of ecosystems and biological communities in his nature, as part of his nature, what he, what he observed and thought about. We hear from him about prairies and the animals that live there, the nature of prairies, the high deserts of the West, and their flora and fauna. At least two kinds of forests, the conifer forests of California and the hardwood forests of the East. Lakes, at least three kinds of lakes are uh, mentioned and dwelt upon significantly in his books. There is the, the dry lakes, the salt lakes, such as Salt Lake, Great Salt Lake, and Mono Lake, Lake Mono in California, and uh, Lake Tahoe, a freshwater, beautiful lake. Rivers and streams flow throughout his um, book. The ocean makes its appearance as he travels through the Sandwich Islands, um, and of course the islands themselves are a fascinating sight for him to see. Also, virtually every significant form of natural phenomenon, force and disaster, occur uh, in the book at some point. Some of the, his discussions or his observations of natural disasters are comical and others are life-threatening. He talks about climate, general climate and specific climate, about the weather and its changeability. Wind, storms, blizzards make their appearance. Rain, flood, drought likewise do as well. He speaks of landslides and earthquakes, especially in, this, uh, in San Francisco that was uh, notorious for earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions. Finally, geographic variety finishes his Mark Twain's nature as he saw it and experienced it. The landscapes were numerous, mountainous landscapes, hills, valleys, canyons, watersheds, um, rivers, lakes, deserts, and of course volcanoes and other geographical features occur throughout uh, his book. All right, that's one. And the uh, alternate meaning of the title what is Mark Twain's nature, personal nature, as revealed in his nature writing? <coughs> well, for Twain, uh, life is, is a central issue in, his, in this book. He's, he, focuses, he focuses on the diversity of life, the struggle for survival, the renewal of life. He's also fascinated in, uh, and intrigued by the, the, the changing seasons and finds that uh, the presence of a changeable climate like that is uh, invigorating and stimulating. He's curious about virtually all aspects of nature. He's a keen observer of nature. He notices and ponders what he experiences. Perhaps he notices things that most of us would not notice, would not see, would not think about. He's highly objective at times and subjective at other times. So his range of his thoughts about nature run from factual, uh, experiential, um, empirical to highly subjective, almost poetic. The states of being that he um, experiences in, in nature are also diverse. Tranquility he values greatly. Solitude. Episodes of fear appear now and then. And of course humor. He finds many of nature's uh, phenomena uh, have a, a humorous side to them. The one I recall other than the tarantula escape is being snowbound in the Sierra Nevadas with his buddies and thinking that death is near. They, uh, they, they, uh, they, agree, they, uh, they lie down in the snow waiting to move on to the next plane of existence, only to wake up the next morning with a uh, cabin just a few feet away from me, from where they uh, decided to end life and end it. And of course they all felt very embarrassed and self-conscious about uh, being so close but being so far. Queen is also a risk taker. He actually climbs down into the Kilauea crater and traverses parts of it, uh, just feet away from where there is hot lava and bubbling. Um, 
He's adventurous. He's willing to take chances to see and to experience to the fullest what nature has to offer. So, based on what you've heard and seen tonight, was Mark Twain a nature writer? Does Roughing It belong on a bookshelf reserved for nature books? Well, I think it does. Uh, what do you think? And i uh, got one more slide because it has special interest to we, us, in uh, the Finger Lakes. Click on the next Oh, stop here. Uh, uh, Mark Twain finished his book, Roughing It, at Quarry Farm in the main house, and while finishing Roughing It during the summer of 1871, he and Joe Goodman, Joe Goodman was an editor at the uh, Virginia City newspaper and hired Twain as a reporter, which initiated Twain's career as a writer. Twain invited Joe Goodman to come to Elmira to Quarry Farm to help him get over his, his uh, writer's block. Um, he was not making good progress on the book and he needed some help. Um, largely, his, he was discouraged uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, Goodman read what had been written so far and pronounced it the best work that he's seen, the best work Mark that you've done so far, for Sam. Uh, this encouraged Twain. Um, he then began to uh, write, working on finishing the book. In the meantime, he and Joe would spend mornings at the old quarry looking for fossils and arranging them in what they thought were valid categories. Uh, pontificating about this and that. They weren't the you know, paleontologists, um, but they have, certainly had a great time uh, arguing about uh, fossils, but also reminiscing about the days in Nevada, bringing back memories, bringing back the language uh, that had escaped Twain. And the most important find in the quarry was Twain found his funny bone again. Fortunately, he had not fossilized yet, and so uh, the rest is history. <laughs> Next, next slide, because I want to show one more. Um, uh, next one, and then we'll, we're done. Um, in the book, Twain refers to Watkins Glen, New York. And he compares a waterfall. He often compares natural features um, with one another in, in a contest like. And he compares a thousand foot waterfall in Hawaii with uh, Rainbow Falls in uh, Watkins Glen State Park. And this is the one he prefers. He felt that it's uh, more approachable, it has a, it's a personal touch, it's, uh, uh, it has a charm to it. Uh, that obviously arithmetic, he says, will, would relegate this waterfall to insignificance, but uh, uh, he felt that the, the overall scene and quality of the water, waterfall, as he describes it, uh, uh, if left to compete for honors simply on scenic grace and beauty, it could challenge the old world and the new to produce its peer. So that is uh, Rainbow Falls that is pouring into oh, yeah. the main channel, river channel, uh, that it forms Watkins Glen. I happened to catch it when uh, it had been raining uh, significantly a few days, a week or so before, and you can actually see a rainbow if you're on the other side and you're in the evening and in the afternoon, it's there. It's there. So your questions and uh, your questions please, your comments, I'd appreciate any thoughts you might have, reactions. Pardon me? The types of soil? Um, he mentioned sand, uh, rubble, rock. Uh, I don't specifically recall uh, particular soil types other than uh, the soil that certain plants live in. Sandy soil, dry soil, uh, rubble, rock, pebbles. Nothing more than that that I recall. Yes? There was a famous Pratt family in Elmira. Are you a descendant of it? <laughs> Possibly, but there's a more remarkable coincidence. Susan Crane, who built a study for Mark Twain, um, my mother, before she was married, her name was Susan Crane. <laughs> <laughs> so I might be related to Theodore. I don't know. I have something that works looking into. My, my Cranes came from Indiana. They were Hoosiers. I met my great grandfather, my great great grandfather, who was a school teacher, and I have his school bell among my relics. So, who knows? I think it's a fascinating coincidence. Probably nothing to it, but it's fun to mention. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Yes, yeah, this is sort of a real tangential question. 
um, not knowing a whole lot about this period, when I read Moby Dick on my own, and I, I was aghast that there were 200 and some pages all about whales, which I immediately skipped over. Now, the idea that Mark Twain, a, a great writer, should choose to make money, that's the reason people write, for his second book on nature. I'm wondering, did the reading, educated reading public in the 19th century have an enormous appetite for this kind of stuff, nature? More so than we did? I think it was building. John Muir, the, the, the penultimate nature, nature naturalist, the one who convinced uh, Teddy Roosevelt to set aside land in the West for public parks. Um, there was a growing awareness of the need to protect the environment, uh, the natural resources, because they were being ravaged by timber interests, mining, uh, farming, and there was a, a general sense that uh, we're losing something valuable. Now, whether that was widespread or not, that's something I wish to re research to see perhaps who read Roughing It, who might have been um, influenced in the decision to allocate public lands for natural parks. Um, um, one side, one side uh, to this is that Mark Twain, in 1879, either accidentally or on purpose, met Charles Darwin in the Lake District of England. And the two of them took a ferry ride across Lake Elsmere, I think, to a village. And I would have loved to have listened to that conversation. Uh, but it was reported to Twain that, that uh, Darwin read Twain's books uh, until he fell asleep. And <laughs> the question is whether, what the, what, was that a uh, derogatory or a backhand compliment or what? Uh, but I suspect if you read any of Twain's books, Roughing It was one of them. It was available. Huck Finn had not been published yet. Uh, Darwin died in 1882, I, I think, 1882. So this is uh, Twain and Darwin met the Meaning of Minds uh, in 1879. So whatever Twain had written and published up to 1879, 1880, 81, are books that Darwin read, I suspect. This is one of them. What else? Uh, I have a question. Uh, early on in your uh, lecture, you, st you stated that uh, Twain's approach to uh, nature uh, description was like kind of classic. And I, I wanted to find out how is he out of the mainstream? Um, he, uh, you'd be hard, yes, good question, excellent question. You'd be hard pressed to find a nature writer of his time that would incorporate humor into the natural world. And he does several times. There's the Riding the uh, Mexican plug horse, a, domestic, a domesticated animal, but in nature anyway. And there's the surviving the blizzard of 1862 or three, uh, and there are a few other episodes that are just pure comic. Um, and the variety. Wayne doesn't dwell on just one aspect of the natural world. He moves around a lot, like a shotgun. Um, my sense of what I've read of nature writers, they're more focused. They have an agenda. Twain was just reporting what he saw, felt, and thought about without any uh, limits to, to topics and to ideas and themes. Yes? Uh, one thing, wasn't he very close to um, Walden, you know, the Thoreau, in terms of how he's trying to uh, become one with nature? Yes. Especially this, the one that you described as the season, the seeing one uh, need to accommodate uh, oneself with nature. Kind of, uh, very much in, in the mainstream of nature. Uh, Almost transcendental. Yeah. You're absolutely very astute as observation. Uh, several times Twain dealt, becomes um, almost transfixed by the, the natural wonders that he sees. He becomes one with nature um, until the next episode, until the great tarantula escape. So he, he's in and out of these transcendental meditative states. Um, very poetic, very intensely personal, uh, highly spiritual or philosophical. He begins to peel back uh, the exterior of the natural world to see what's underneath. And he finds uh, enjoyment, uh, solitude, peace of mind, uh, much of what Walden urges us to think about and to and try to find when we go into nature, into the natural world. Yes, question? Um. I thought of an answer for the first gentleman. Um, about that time, the Hudson River School was uh, 
was getting going where the artists were uh, doing wonderful landscapes yes. and great ones of, uh, of local mountain views and so forth that they thought competed very well with, uh, with European Grand Mountains. And um, this was before uh, <coughs> photography had taken over to the point where you could visualize something so well with photography. And so um, I think part of an answer for him is that, uh, that artists at that time had been captured by nature. And so I think it was obvious then that, that he also wrote about it too. The, uh, the artist that come to mind in particular is Albert <coughs> Beershot. Who wrote the yeah, huge panoramas yeah. of the West, panoramic vistas, including uh, including Lake Tahoe, which, by the way, looks nothing like Lake Tahoe, but his creative <laughs> genius went poetic license, so to speak, painter's license. So uh, this was the time that the, the west of this, the western part of this nation, was being explored and um, being captured um, by painting, by chronicles of. Of visitors who go to the West and report back, and Twain is just is one of those. But I find his writing particularly engaging, and um, it, he never stands still. Uh, he's moving as as his preference is to look for diversity, for change, are key elements in his um, perception of nature. And my future future research is to see if that trend, that tendency, persists in the other travel books that he wrote later, as well as his the predecessor, Innocence Abroad which he does report on natural phenomena of various sorts, humorous as well as factual, subjective versus philosophical. Any other questions, please? Yes? Uh, did Mark Twain make any comments about Walden? Uh, I don't know whether he did or not. I, I, um, I need to investigate that. I presume he was aware of it. Probably he was aware. He, he was a well-read person. and. Um, Perhaps looking at his uh, inventory of his the books in his library might suggest that he did read Walden. He read Darwin, parts of Darwin, Origin of Species, and a few others, so he was aware of the emerging theory of evolution by natural selection. Among other scientists, he was fascinated with technology. There's a photograph of Twain in Tesla's laboratory looking at electrical current. Remember, Tesla is the one that saved us from Edison's direct current scheme that would have been a disaster with alternating current, which is more, much more effective. And he had, Twain and Tesla were very familiar with one another. Twain found science and technology out of a fascinating area. And this is another one, natural science, out of the wilderness science. Yes? Never had a professional education, did he? No. He didn't no. Self trained. What he knew, he learned through experience or through reading. Yeah. He was well versed in the English language. Yes. And produced it beautifully for just coming out that way. Exactly. And he, of course, being very intelligent, he would read a book and he often would uh, uh, put his unique signature on it in terms of his comments, his disagreements with the author. Yes and no. This is this is crazy. This is. He uh, let the author know his opinion. In other words, the use of English language was magnificent. Any more questions? All right. Well then, thank you again very much.